<clears throat> I'm very happy to be here this evening. And uh, since I was given a free hand and asked to talk about something I really care about, I chose this subject. Uh, we are really at an extraordinary place in uh, uh, not only human history, but uh, history of all living things on this earth, because as you certainly all are aware of, we're shifting from one climate period to a radically different climate period. So life, and not only human life, every life on Earth is going to be different. Uh, certainly at the beginning of the next century, and it will start being different much earlier, certainly during your own lifetime. So this fact that we are all going through a huge revolution uh, is going to mark your own life experiences. Uh, <coughs> I have um, followed very ancient historical traditions of literally worshipping the sun uh, because it was recognized very early that uh, all life on Earth is totally dependent on the sun. And uh, I remember, uh, incidentally, I should first mention to this group that about, let's see, two, about six, seven years ago, I was the producer of a film on this campus uh, called The Power of the Sun. And um, it was well received. We had a wonderful uh, senior director, a professional. And uh, it, in the meantime, has been translated into, I think, 12 different languages. And I have shown it uh, in many parts of the world, probably that many different countries. Uh, and uh, you can look me up in the campus telephone book and call and uh, my secretary and uh, speak with her. If you're interested in um, having a copy, and if you want to show it to a regular, sort of typically class size group, uh, 30 people or more, we'll be happy to give it to you free of charge. If you want it for uh, the next uh, birthday present for your boyfriend or <laughs> girlfriend, uh, you'll pay five dollars. <laughs> uh, that's a pretty good deal, right? <laughs> Um, so uh, the reason I was just thinking about this film was because we started at the beginning with an absolutely wonderful ancient Egyptian relief. And you see on it the pharaoh's family. So the pharaoh is a certain size on that relief, maybe let's say two feet tall. <coughs> And he's followed by his wife, who is about one foot tall. <laughs> and uh, behind his wife uh, are the, is that child, and she's on that relief, about six <laughs> inches tall. But it's an absolutely wonderful uh, work of art. Uh, uh, you see the sun, and the rays of the sun, and the rays of the sun are striking uh, perhaps three or four plants that are coming out. So they had a perfectly clear idea that everything growing uh, depended on the sun. Um, so the sun is important, was important uh, 3,000 years ago, and it, it is just as important today. Uh, 
here I have been working. I, I keep up my uh, activity in uh, solar energy. I am a uh, senior consultant to the National Laboratory for Renewable Energy, which is uh, located in the state of Colorado. And I put down here a kind of open-ended title. Uh, leave off the top line and it would read a world powered predominantly by solar and wind energy. And you ask, well, where is this world? Well, it doesn't exist, right? There's no such world now. But are there serious prospects for our world uh, being powered predominantly by solar and wind energy? And if the answer is yes, when might that be? Be. So that's uh, what I want to talk with you. And I'm not keeping you all wor uh, nervous here. I want to tell you that it's a realistic question. It's not a crazy question. But I'm not saying, I'm not going so far as to say that the future, in fact, that I'm convinced that the future will, in fact, be powered predominantly by solar and wind energy. I'm also, I want to say that right at the beginning, um, take something very important. People are talking about uh, huge natural gas supplies that are, have become available with new technologies and uh, and also uh, a particular kind of uh, liquid fossil fuel that is now gradually being exported from mostly from Canada into this country. But unfortunately, it creates a huge amount when it is burned. It creates a huge amount of carbon dioxide, which as surely everybody in this audience knows has been such a, a threatening issue, uh, global warming. Uh, so uh, I will be assuming in this talk that the major contributors to global warming at this time namely coal and natural gas, of which there are fairly ample supplies. But they will not be burned for, to extract energy from them because of their uh, aggravating contribution to global warming. So that's an underlying optimistic assumption under this uh, presentation. Uh, okay. Where's this baby? <laughs> I, I have it here. Okay, this is just an overview and I will be brief and not spend much time on it. Uh, this, these are the different World Primary Fuel Mix uh, 2008. That's more or less the present. And you see the big uh, yellow area on the left, about one third, crude oil. We have reached just now, just this year or last year, or maybe next year, what's called peak oil. Uh, we are at the point where the consumption of oil that has been growing in the past will just now begin to decrease because we are exhausting it. Um, natural gas is, I uh, don't know what to call this color, lower right. Uh, uh, crude oil, by the way, is uh, 
for plutonium. Per three of these numbers, roughly one third. Natural gas is roughly one quarter. Um, uh, coal, upper right, is uh, also about a quarter. And then you have minor other contributions. They're all very important, but because of your time limit during this presentation and my time li limit, which is even greater, I will not uh, get into it. So that gives orients you about the variety and the, and the fact that I just mentioned that crude oil is on its way out, natural gas is following by about 10 years, that's almost immediately, even on the scale of your lives. Uh, and coal is a very large supply, and if we did burn it, uh, it would last, uh, not quite certain, but something like perhaps 200 years. But we have global warming. And uh, you, of course, commercial interests, if you watch television, I don't watch it much, but when I watch it, I'm interested in advertisements having to do with energy. So, for example, <coughs> gas or coal always comes with an adjective clean, clean gas, clean coal. Well, it's in the, in the minds of the people speaking or in the pocketbooks of the people speaking. It doesn't exist. Uh, the, the, the cost of, uh, for example, uh, burning gas, and then, uh, well, the word that's being used is an unusual word, sequestering, which means sort of putting aside uh, the um, a product of this combustion, namely carbon dioxide, is enormous. It would make uh, the, the cost uh, at the moment, quite unacceptable. And the clean gas or the clean coal is what they're working on, but they've been working on it for a uh, 100 years. And there are basic uh, chemical considerations that make that very, very unlikely to be achieved in the, in the foreseeable future. Uh, okay, go on. Uh, this just focuses now on, on oil. And uh, let's see, do we have oil altogether? I, I can't see that at the moment, not from where I'm standing. Uh, non crude oil is the important part. and. The very top is natural gas liquids. That's particularly bad for global warming. So we have a problem. Here's another problem. And your generation has a lot to say about this. So just to orient you quickly, so you don't have to read all the scissor and ordinate and so on. You can say, roughly speaking, between 1950 to the present, and then we extrapolate another 50 years, roughly, world population has been and continues to grow by one billion a decade. In, in the Last century alone, the world population approximately quadrupled. Uh, can you try to visualize, let's say, Santa Barbara with four <coughs> times its present uh, population, or Calcutta with four times its present population? We are at the end of this. I mean, this cannot go on and will not go on. Big okay. problem. Uh, 
says, nobody in this room, as far as I can see, who could remember this popular cartoon. Uh, Pogo, a great hero of uh, in the cartoon era, something, well, the, the date is there, uh, 1971. And uh, you can read this. And it's uh, wonderful uh, artistry and, uh, and really wonderful text going with it. And the, whoops. Sorry, this does not do what I wanted to do. Not most of the time. All right. Here we are. Is, is the final remark. Uh, they are discussing all this rubbish that's in, in the beautiful forest, and they are walking on it. And, uh, and then the, f the philosopher, Pogo, says, yep, son, we have met the enemy, and he's us. Very, what the French call a very bon mot, a good word. Global oil production per person. We've gone over the peak. Global oil production in total, we have not yet gone over the peak. But population is, is rising. And so if you take uh, total, uh, Oil, pr oil production, global oil production, uh, that's still rising. But since you're dividing it by population growth, that rises more, more greatly, uh, more rapidly. You see that the peak, maybe today, uh, it's just about now. So from, from now on, oil production and oil consumption per person is going to be limited by oil supply. This is really, and since my time is short, this may be perhaps the last thing I'll show you. It's the key uh, Let's focus graph. here on where we are now, roughly at the left edge of this graph. And you see that Oil and natural gas is already declining together. I take them together just to <laughs> overload the picture. So actually, oil is actually beginning to decline. Natural gas, not yet. But <coughs> loosely speaking, taken together, they are declining in this d decade, slowly, by about something like 2% per year. Uh, those taken together <coughs> uh, were the two main sources of energy on that pie chart. Now I contrast this with what is happening with the combination of solar and wind. Those are truly renewable sources. Not quite truly, because you give up, you have to make these things, and in making them, uh, you produce some carbon dioxide. But it's something on the order of 5 to 10 percent. So it's a second order effect. Uh, and that's this purple line, which starts today at about 2 or 3 percent of the total consumption of energy. So you say, well, forget about it. I mean, it's just negative. However, in the last five or six years, the production and the consumption of these two truly renewable resources has increased by a factor of two every two years. 
factor of two every two years means a factor of four in four years. It means a factor of eight in another two years, which is in six years. Uh, a factor of 16 in eight years. It's an exponential growth. And that beats everything. So this exponential growth, that's the curve that starts quite flat at a very low value today, and then shoots up. And you see it intersects the oil plus natural uh, gas production at about 2020, 2021 or so. <coughs> and that's what I cons I like to describe as a, as a major uh, revolution in the world's availability of energy. It shifts from these uh, polluting sources to clean sources. Now, if I would leave now, uh, you would be to too optimistic. <laughs> because uh, I, perhaps I should uh, say something first. Uh, what I should say first is six or seven years, China wasn't in the picture at all when it came to uh, solar and wind energy. Since about one or two years, they've been number one in the world. And they're still moving ahead of everybody. Don't know about you, but I'm very grateful to them. I'm very friendly with a person who makes solar, uh, and who distributes and installs solar panels in this town. I got to know him when he installed our solar panels. And of course, for him, this competition uh, is, an, is an issue on one hand. On the other, is a positive factor. And from another perspective, it's a negative factor. The producers, American pr makers of solar energy, uh, hit very hard because the Chinese produce them at a substantially lower price. And so there is a global uh, overwhelming competition with American products. On the other hand, from a global point of view, it's a blessing because these solar energy and wind, wind energy, the story is very similar. Uh, they are the hope for the future. And that is progressing primarily because of the uh, change of national policy in China. So that's an interesting story how that happened. That is for another talk and another time. And uh, that's my optimism. optimism. It's that intersection. And you see that intersection, at that intersection, total energy, which is the gold-colored curve, is actually considerably greater than where we are now. So if you have confidence in this solar wind uh, coming up, solar wind picture, then you can be very optimistic. But please temper your confidence. There are many forces trying to prevent this. Uh, <coughs> this started first with former Vice President Cheney, uh, who was in charge of energy policy under the Bush administration. And uh, so he convened a meeting uh, to advise him on energy policy early in the administration. And the rumor got out that there were quite a few people representing uh, particularly the oil companies at the time at that meeting. 
fact, there was a rumor that they were virtually all oil company executives. And, uh, and uh, when Vice President Cheney was asked, who was it you're meeting? He said, uh, uh, as a member of the administration, I'm not required to tell you this, and I won't tell you. So we don't know yet who was at the meeting. So this, this is not an easy matter. If there are people here in the social sciences, they have a big job to do also. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs>